Welcome to the Libertarian Alliance. Uh, this week we've got a talk by Ray Percival on the myth of the closed mind. I believe Ray would hold, as I would certainly hold, that not only is the closed mind a myth, but the open mind is a myth as well. What we all have is the biased, the erring mind. In other words, we're all inclined to be biased towards the way how we see the world, for, at least in the short run. Uh, and uh, so we don't always see the facts without a lot of struggling with what the philosophers call the epistemological problem. Uh, with that, I'll uh, leave it open to you, Ray. Thank you, David. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here to talk about the thesis, the, the idea of the closed mind. The idea of the closed mind is that there are some people or some systems of ideas that are insulated or immunized against the impact of truth and rational ar argument. Um, and I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through the stock arguments for the closed mind and hopefully along the way explode each one. Um, a very popular uh, argument for the closed mind is that people adopt ideas and maintain them because of emotion, specifically emotion that is disconnected in some way from theory. Uh, but my answer to that is that all our emotions are based on our theory about the world and our place in it. And this idea goes back to the Stoics, the ancient Greek philosophers, who uh, argued that all the same thesis, that all emotion cannot be even understood unless it's, it's uh, encased in a theoretical context. Um, uh, this, uh, this way of th looking at things has been quite influential um, recently in the emergence of uh, rational emotive therapy, which you may have heard of. Um, to give you, a, just to illustrate what I mean by how our emotions are controlled by our theory about what the world is like and what is happening in it, Imagine a um, husband comes back uh, to his home, um, looks over the fence and sees a man uh, ag aggressively approaching his wife with an axe. He immediately becomes angry, rushes into the garden, only to see that the, the man with the axe is actually fending off a dog that was attacking his wife. His emotions will almost immediately shift uh, to a different, um, a different kind of emotion. So that just illustrates in a, you know, a simple uh, thought experiment the connection between theory or thought and emotion. Generally, I would um, claim that all cognition and is emotional and all emotion is cognitive. Uh, a, more, a more specific uh, argument for the irrationality um, of human beings or their adoption of ideas is what's known as wishful thinking. Um, people adopt ideas because they want them to be true. They wish something to be true. That Marxism or communism uh, is possible. Uh, people uh, adopt that idea because they imagine that it's a, a, a wonderful possibility. And because it's based on wishful thinking and not a careful comparison of rational arguments, the rational argument cannot um, have any effect on a fanatical, a, a fanatical uh, Marxist who has adopted Marxism and the idea of communism based on their wishful thinking. My response to that is to look at uh, wishful thinking as a kind of a heuristic for um, dealing with knowledge or imperfect knowledge um, in, a, in a largely unknown world. We are infinitely ignorant and we're prone to error. We're, we're fallible beings. And 
uh, wishful thinking is, is, is uh, <coughs> wishful thinking can maintain a belief so that it can be properly properly tested. Because you have to bear in mind that we can actually be uh, wrong even about our direct observations. So perhaps we have a, a wishful thought, we, we notice a counterexample, but we persist in believing it. Now, you might think, well, that's obviously irrational, isn't it? Why don't you just um, abandon the belief, belief in the face of the counterexample? Well, my point is, we may be wrong about the, the counterexample. Even our direct observations are theory-laden. They, they have a tentative conjectural character to them. Um, so I would, I would say that it's a heuristic for exploring a largely unknown world by a fallible organism, which we are. Um, but it's not, and that it wouldn't, it, it doesn't, a, doesn't impose an absolute uh, dogmatism or obstin obstinacy in the, in the, in the uh, belief. The amount or with which the person would uh, adhere or stick to the belief, even in the face of counter evidence, is stake dependent, or it's dependent on the values at stake. It makes sense for very, if you have an important belief, to retest it even many times. So that's my uh, response to that. The uh, equally, on the other side, we have fearful thinking. You know, believing something is the case because we fear it. It may be the case. Again, um, these it's a kind of belief that emerges where the stakes are high, where it, the values are important and urgent. So that the, the relevant theories or beliefs need to be severely tested. Third argument is that based that the, yeah, the, the, the third argument is that uh, ideologies or systems of ideas are retained independently of rational argument because the people who have adopted those ideologies are locked within li a linguistic uh, framework or theoretical framework or a conceptual paradigm. You've probably all heard of uh, Newspeak, um, George Orwell's idea that uh, in uh, the, the you know, classic novel 1984, um, that the state could create a linguistic framework in which uh, the population's minds could be imprisoned. Um, and this idea has probably been bolstered by uh, the, the philosopher, no, not the, not the philosopher, the historian of, of science, Thomas Kuhn. And Kuhn had the idea that there were um, periods of time in the development of science where all the scientists at a given era were under the uh, were locked, as it, as it were, into their paradigm of observing the world, categorizing it, and that um, scientists from different eras, if they were to meet, they wouldn't actually be able to understand one another. They would be talking past one another because the very concepts that they're using are, do, are not commensurate. Um, so, if, New if Newton had met Einstein, according to Kuhn, uh, they wouldn't understand each other. Um, another example is the, the is the thesis of uh, Benjamin Lee Whorf, who held that um, different cultures categorize the world um, in different ways, and this is imposed on them by the, sh the shared that there are shared language. So different languages and different cultures mean you have different thought patterns. And again, there's, there's no uh, way that they can understand each other. Um, I'll just quote 
I'll read you this quote, because it's quite a strong claim um, from Worf. We cut nature up, organize it into concepts, and ascribe significances as we do, largely because we are parties to an agreement to organize it in this way. An agreement that holds throughout our speech community and is codified in the patterns of our language. The agreement is, of course, an implicit and unstated one, but its terms are absolutely obligatory. We cannot talk at all except by subscribing to the organization and classification of data which the agreement decrees. Now, my rough uh, initial re reply to that is that all ideologies or linguistic systems or conceptual frameworks require learning. Um, but learning, um, if you look, involves a trial and error process. So there are always going to be Winstons who fail to learn the language or, or introduce um, inadvertently or by intention innovations in that language. So that, you know, ben, uh, Thomas Kuhn's idea and uh, Benjamin Lee Worf's idea that can, people uh, can be locked into a linguistic framework doesn't seem to, to hold water if you look at the epistemological problem of how do you learn that language anyway. Um, you, someone might say, well, would it not be possible for, say, a, the, a state, you know, the thought police, to monitor uh, deviations from the sanctioned language? Um, and my uh, uh, reply there then is, what that does, it only brings, it takes the problem of learning, the trial in, this trial and error process, just up to another level. So the thought police themselves, they would have to learn what was the canonical language and what constitutes a deviation from that. With regard to Worf's hypothesis that language determines thought uh, or even our very perception of reality, um, it's largely been refuted. With regard to, for example, colour systems throughout the world in different cultures, um, there doesn't seem to be that degree of um, variety. Um, there is variety, but it's, it's kind of, it fits into the slots that are produced by our, our physiology of our perceptual apparatus, the in particular the rods and cones in our retina. Uh, they uh, mostly dominate how we categorize the world in terms of color. Um, if a culture has two colors, they, it's, that's black and white. If they have three, it's black, white, and red. If they have four colors, they have black, white, red, and either yellow or green. And that's how it uh, progresses up to... Um, at seven, seven, they have seven colours in black, white, red, green, yellow, blue, and brown. Um, uh, with regard to the relationship between thought and language, uh, both Steven Pinker and Alison Gopnik, as they've done very interesting research on this, um, especially Gopnik uh, points out that Infants seem to be operating, pre-linguist, you know, pre-linguistic infants seem to be operating with a theory about the world, and that this is prior to, both, you know, um, and lo it's logically uh, more fundamental than than language. Uh, another argument. Uh, which is quite common um, and can be contributed to, excuse me, can be attributed to Karl Popper, is the idea that some systems of ideas become insulated by developing what are known as immunizing stratagems. You have the 
basic theory and in, in reaction to meeting counterexamples or counterarguments, the theory is slightly modified or a extra assumption is um, tacked on to the theory and supposedly saving the theory from refutation. For example, you, uh, the standard prophecy or prediction of Marxism was that communism would emerge in the most highly advanced uh, societies. And when that failed to happen, various Marxists pro proffered the possibility that there were countervailing factors. So you can, you can see how you can play with that. You can, uh, maybe imperialism uh, interfered with uh, the emergence of communism. Excuse me. Um, and the problem with, if you look at the problem in terms of the strategy of propagating a message through a population of minds and then from one generation to the next, it's a very poor strategy to save a theory in this way because it either empties the theory of its original meaning, so you're not really saving the theory, or it encumbers it with excess theoretical baggage, which itself has to be learned by each acolyte, each propagandist. So the, 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 uh, the fidelity with which the message is propagated is impaired. Uh, a similar or related idea is that some ideologies make a, a distinction between what you might call the, the hard core, theoretical core, excuse me, which is sacrosanct and preserved uh, under all circumstances, and surrounded by what might be called a protective, protective belt of hypotheses, which can take the deformations and modifications introduced by, or, or not introduced by, but um, provoked by counterexamples. But there are problems with this, not only in terms of how easy, how hard it, or easy it is to, to copy a message or propagate it, but there. Are, are logical problems, insuperable lo logical problems, of distinguishing between what is the dispensable, supposedly the dispensable protective belt and the core of the theory or doctrine. So you can never be sure by altering cosmetically the nose, you may, da you may end up damaging the face or the, you know, the, the core of the, the organ, the organ <coughs> organism that this um, I ideology is. And that's due to, um, well, I applied that in the book from the work of Kurt Gerdell and Alonzo Church. And in particular, uh, Church discovered that, and proved, I think it was in the 1930s, that uh, you can't fully survey all of the possible counterexamples, even in kind, to any given doctrine. So you can't prepare systematically in that way by you know, having your core system and then clothing it in a protective belt. Blind faith is another interesting one. Um, that some people adopt ideas or beliefs um, because they've committed themselves to those ideas in a kind or supposed, supposedly special psychological state called faith that, again, is impregnable. It, it, it's completely sealed, sealed off from counter-arguments. We've all heard people say, well, you won't... You, will not convince me because I am committed by faith. Now, an interesting response to that, I think, is to say, well, belief 
itself is not something that you can commit yourself to, actually, because it's an involuntary process. You can say what you like. You can say, I believe such and such. And you can make uh, a com you know, an, an avowal of uh, being faithfully committed as a kind of a loyal loyalty gesture to your creed or your church. But the human mind um, is constantly scanning, uh, uh, constantly scanning um, the world and revising its beliefs in a process which is involuntary. We, we can only kind of uh, get out of it by taking drugs or going to sleep. Just a moment. This is, you might find this interesting, from uh, Sam Harris um, in the, his book, The End of Faith. The idea, therefore, that religious faith is somehow a sacred human convention, distinguished as it is both by the extravagance, extravagance of its claims and by the paucity of, it, of its evidence, is really too great a monstrosity to be appreciated in all its glory. Religious faith represents so uncompromising a misuse of the power of our minds that it forms a kind of perverse cultural singularity, a vanishing point beyond which rational discourse proves impossible. That's quite a strong claim, I think. And he seems to be swallowing this idea that uh, belief is a voluntary process. You just decide um, what your beliefs are and you either do it irrationally or rationally you, you either compare and contrast different uh, views and arguments and then decide make a you know a voluntary decision i'm going to believe this um or that you, you reject the, be the belief what i'm saying is that if you can research a, a belief more or less thoroughly but the belief that you end up with at the end of that research is not really something that you, you have decided to, to have. Um, one question which uh, emerges when you're thinking about the use of uh, this talk of faith is why, um, why do people say, um, you won't convince me because maybe the, the ta they are tacitly aware of the power of argument to transform their beliefs in, in an involuntary manner that they can't really, they have no control over the impact of the, the rational argument that you might present to them. Okay, so a very um, mind viruses um, which is uh, <laughs> it's, uh, <clears throat> it's an idea of uh, Richard Dawkins that uh, some ideas are like computer viruses uh, that, that that control our our thinking um, and we adopt them not through again we don't adopt them through rationally comparing alternative views um, and making a justified conclusion but we just adopt them simply because they are the ideas that happen to be around, especially when we're infants, or, I mean, ch children. Um, and <clears throat> so the, the ideas on this line of thought, the, the ideas that get adopted and copied and, and propagated through populations are not the ones that are truth-like or consistent but they're they're just very good at making copies of themselves like computer viruses um, the problem with the main problem i think with this is again we come back to the our the, the theories that we use our mind uses are prior logically prior to the bits of language that we might or statements or doctrines that we might adopt from our culture. Um, and children come into the world already armed with a network of theories about 
or expectations about the world. So when a child um, hears their parents saying maybe a, 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 you know, a snippet from uh, is, Islamic thought, the child ends up uh, assimilating that snippet of the doctrine to her own uh, network of theories. But then, the, and, and the children also have a rudimentary logic, so they already start working out their own implications uh, from their own theory, their own rudimentary theories about the world, and these snippets of their uh, no, parental um, ideas. And so they will end up saying, not just a photocopy of what they've heard, but they'll say things that their parents would never have said. It can, can be very, inter uh, very interesting and very uh, amusing. Um, Finally, our dumb decision rules that we seem to operate with. Psychologists have done a lot of research, in particular uh, Daniel Kahneman, um, Thinking Slow, Thinking Fast, you might have seen that in the bookshops. Um, and the idea there is that we have these systematic biases that are just irrepressible. They just keep on uh, interfering with our thought and our judgment all the time. Um, that my response to that is that to it completely accept that we do have these systematic biases and they're very interesting. And but <clears throat> uh, to give you I'll give you uh, there's two examples. This one is called anchoring where you um, you, you either you generate it or somebody else suggests it to you. For instance, you might be bargaining, bargaining about the price of something um, uh, and someone suggests a price. And then the, what's been observed is that the, the, the rest of the, de, the negotiation tends to centre around that initial anchor. So that's a bias that we tend to have. Another one is uh, the ease of recall rule. So you tend to estimate the relative probability or reliability of something on how easily you can remember or recall events of that kind. For example, we, we think, most people tend to think that nuclear power plants have a, a, a far higher chance or unreliability, or there's a far higher chance of breakdown in a nuclear power plant than in equivalent um, you know, high po high powered sources, industrial sources of energy, whereas the statistics actually under undermine that, and it's just simply because we remember more easily the dramatic uh, images that we have centering around nuclear power. Um, but so my uh, response to that is that it doesn't mean that we are we're close to argument or that we're irrational. It just means that if we're economising on time, then it's good to have something to work with. Um, and there's a methodological point to make here, that a lot of this literature assumes that you can't start with conjectures or guesses. But the, the, uh, Karl Popper argues, I think quite... Um, Quite, quite superbly, actually, that um, that it's you can operate with conjectures uh, as long as you keep them open to rigorous uh, critical evaluation. So you can pick uh, which stocks you're going to uh, buy by consulting tea leaves. That's you've, you've started with that, but as soon as you've picked that, then you start to have, have a look at the information, look for counterexamples. And adjust your 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 trading or your hypotheses in line with that. Um,
yeah, I think that, that really covers the the stock, the, the you know the main arguments for the for the uh, the closed mind. Thank you very much. Are there any comments or questions, David? Yes. Uh, could you just provide some sort of working definition of what a belief is? Uh, I, I don't usually ask for definitions, but I think in this context it might be quite important because I'm not entirely clear whether you are uh, using the word belief to refer to simply an assessment that having looked at three or four different theories, this one seems to withstand criticism best. What do you think, it, or whether you are using it to mean something else? And if so, what? Yeah, well, um, well, the rough and ready definition is uh, a disposition to assent to uh, a statement or a proposition. Right, so it's a disposition. But I can see. The, the, but there is something, um, just that there is an ambiguity in the, our usage because we, we, we not only have the, the word belief for this internal psychological state of a disposition to you know, assent to something as being true, but we also use it to refer to a body of doctrine or you know, a physically instantiated statement in a book. And though those are quite, they are quite different because one is completely involuntary, the belief, the psychological state, whereas our um, adopting the, the book or the, the statement as it physically instantiated and saying that is true, um, that's a voluntary process. So you're talking about the first stuff. Well, there is an interaction, I think, between them. I think people are more likely to, uh, you know, uh, carry their their capital around, das capital by Marx, if they actually, you know, believe it. Just a quick follow-up. In, in a sense, you answered your you answered the question which your talk poses when you said we don't choose our beliefs. Yes. That that in a sense. Uh, uh, if the question is, do we choose our beliefs, or uh, or are they necessarily affected by uh, hearing criticisms that we perceive as valid? And if that's the question, is it's not really an answer to say we don't choose it. It is an answer, but I'm not quite sure how far it takes us. Well, yeah, because um, yeah, I mean, I, I ought to say something positive rather than just uh, destroying the opposition. <laughs> no, 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 I, think I would like to say, I like to say that to, there is no inevitability for truth to win out in the long run in the competition of ideas. However, it has a propensity to do so. It's rather like betting on a, a you know, the, the top boxer, the prize boxer has a propensity to win, but there's no guarantee. Uh, Jusia? Yes, I'm, uh, thank you very much for, for the talk. I'm um, a bit of two minds on this subject that I don't really understand. But um, you seem to say that the people who change their beliefs, their ideas, and so on, um, if they are either confronted by reality, in other words, facts, mm -hmm. like, for instance, somebody who would be trading the stock market uh, based on tea leaves, probably after a number of turns, that person would have either abandoned tea leaves or gone broke. So it's yeah, not yeah. that other ideas have come to say, look, they are better trading methods than this. It is simply that the shock of reality, the confrontation, with reality um, will simply eliminate 
and build a trade like this. Um, what I find more difficult, and, and you criticize Marx, and, uh, and, and, and of course, implicitly, people who follow Marx's uh, ideology uh, on the role of ideology with Gramsci and with Gauch and, mm. and, and people like this. And because what they say is that actually, in many instances, we are not confronted with reality, as in the example of people who are trading. Um, we have to make choices because a confrontation will take a very, very long time. And um, uh, for instance, socialism is still alive despite the counter evidence that we have that it doesn't work. And, and fascism for many people still is, uh, is alive despite pressure, political pressure and so on. Um, simply because, Marx says, we don't have the words to see reality. I mean, what an ideology says is that it gives you words that mask that reality. Um, I, I don't want to be too long, but I'd just like to give a couple of examples. I mean, this struck me uh, many years ago in France when the, uh, the, the monopoly of a state radio was contested by people uh, who had sort of what was called here pirate radios, bad word. In France, they called it free radios. <coughs> free radios against state radios. Mm -hmm. Now, the government quickly saw the danger, and the uh, intellectual, the talking classes, and so on, put other words on this and said public service radios against private commercial radios. Mm -hmm. So the people who were in favor of free radios switched to, because they didn't want to be associated with private commercial radios. Mm. And the people who were against state radios were all in favor of public service radios. Just calling things changes the perception that you have. A very good recent example is jungle. Who wants to be for jungle? But if you call it rainforest, <laughs> then you are all in favor of rainforest. And this is where I think ideology is very difficult to defeat because you don't have the words to decide, to uh, identify the reality that you are fighting. Interesting. But I, I wouldn't deny that there's such a thing as marketing uh, your ideas and packaging them. Mm. So, yeah, and, and uh, uh, to repeat, um, or rephrase what I said earlier, I don't think that uh, truth would always win out. There's not an inevitable uh, outcome. Mm. Another example, of course, is uh, global warming, which was too easy to find arguments against. Climate change is now what we talk about. It's mm. more difficult to attack. And, and so on. I mean, you know, you find dozens of examples. Well, that's a good example, I, I think, mm -hmm. climate change, because if you look closely at what, what exactly are they, <laughs> are they actually reproducing the same system, or is, it's actually, mm -hmm. mean, perhaps the meaning has changed? Mm -hmm. John? Uh, when asked to explain the, your very brief explanation of the uh, uh, intonation to a sense, yes. this position to a sense is almost like saying, <laughs> which I thought was a rather sidestep the problem. But um, because then it opens up the issue of is belief fundamentally a dispositional thing or an actual uh, conscious Current. state of affairs, which I think it really has to be what it, what it is and everything else is derived from that. But my more important question is do you have any um, examples in particular of how your theory would apply to um, ideology within, uh, possibly in particular, the libertarianism, but not necessarily. How, how it might help uh, when it comes to defending an ideology, not least libertarianism, to, to bring forward these well, ideas. I think it's, 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 it's um, absolutely uh, pertinent to uh, libertarianism or any uh, propagandistic group who wants to 
spread their, their word, their, their doctrine? How do you convince millions of people in the long run um, of the benefits of libertarianism? Uh, well, we're clearly not, clearly not going to try and force people to adopt uh, libertarianism. So what is the alternative, this rational argument? But if we don't believe that um, rational argument has a propen propensity to win, then it's, we're demoralized. Uh, Barbara then, Steve. Uh, the idea that people swallow a doctrine wholesale is undermined by the fact that they don't know what it is, they've swallowed very often. So when they're asked to explain what <laughs> yes, right. the doctrine is, that's, yes. that's not right, is it? I thought it was. Well, what is it then? Well, that can't be right. In other words, trying to improve upon it, or even defend it, you have to learn the arguments of the opponents. Mm -hmm. And they may impress you in some Well, that has to go. We can't say that. Yes. I mean, essentially, we're still right. You know, the core is still there, but we have to go back and this, 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 this. <coughs> and eventually, you, you walk over the line and yes. with the other camp, possibly. So, so what is it that you swallow? I mean, obviously, you may use vocabulary. You may say something not to get shot or cast off to a <coughs> labor camp. So you, may, you may use the right words or, or phraseology, but. Is that, is that believing it? No, of course it is. You believe it's a good idea to say it, but you may not believe it at all. So it's, it's not at all clear what it is people, even if they use sort of the same words, oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a staunch Catholic. Yes. Then you find out they don't know, oh, who would it say? Daniel, Daniel Defoe said 10,000 men would fight popery without knowing whether popery was a man or a horse. <laughs> <laughs> and the same goes here. Yes, I think that's right. I think that a propagandist uh, any um, propagandist uh, with the least chance of, you know, of, of success is locked into the, the logic of the situation of a propagandist, that they simply have to get to know their opponent's arguments, but then they're opening the gate to possible refutation of their beliefs and, and consequent demoralization. Um, Steve, then John, then what would you say, Ray, to the um, point that certain societies seem to have been much more innovative, much more scientifically productive, you know, the ancient Greeks, mm. and certain societies seem to have been in a, well, a, a dark ages, if you like, we, you know, we have that phrase. And, um, you know, Dawkins got into hot water this last week because he, he uh, pointed, out, pointed out that some one Cambridge got college got more Nobel Prize winners than the whole of the Muslim world. Um, uh, how does that fit in with this theory that people are open to ideas? Isn't it possible there are certain societies which tend to um, shut, shut them down to some extent? Yeah, I think it's a relative thing. But, um, well, you know, uh, where did civilization emerge, you know, this, the idea of um, the give and take of argument, civilised debate, goes back to, to ancient Greeks, Thales, Maximander. Um, but it, was that just, uh, you know, a conjectural variation? Was that just a, a variation of ideas, an accidental variation? I, maybe. Maybe there's a, there's a large element of uh, you know, random shuffling in ideas or uh, values in, in the society. What, what would be your answer to that? Well, you know, you're the speaker, Ray. Right? I, I don't want to clear your pitch here, but... Uh, 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 no, I'm just making the point, you know, that it, it looks to some extent as if some certain societies are stuck, you know, and, you know, after hundreds of years, they may emerge. Mm. Um, into you know into a scientific revolution or something like that, but um, your theory seems to suggest at least that the people in these societies would also be open to ideas. So what's yeah, I think preventing them from? Uh, I think there would be developing. Yeah. Have you got a counter example? <laughs> a counter example. Yeah, I think there would be. I think, um, and we 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 can see it uh, today that the the spread of um, sort of scientific 
the scientific culture, if you like, or scientific methodology um, going in, it's sort of migrating into the Gulf and it's changing the, the society there. Whereas, you know, 60 years ago, okay, but everybody... I, mean, I, I won't go on, but it seems to have ups and downs, that history, you know, we mentioned the ancient yes. Greeks. The Romans were technically quite proficient in engineering, but scientifically not so. Yeah, I think... Uh, that, in, in effect, yeah. then you have a period where, uh, in, in the Arab world, you mm. have a, a flourishing of um, knowledge, but then that goes. You know? Yes, I, I completely agree that um, it's possible that the whole world um, adopts uh, some crazy uh, religious idea and you know, uh, advanced industrial society just collapses. It's, it's possible. I don't think there's any inevitability in progress. Not like you should think. John? Your thesis, as I understand it, is not that people are necessarily rational. We can imagine, uh, maybe principally in, 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 in rational ways, Therefore, we can imagine you're meeting somebody who is irrational. And uh, let's assume he is for the sake of argument. Um, I'll tell you his name later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, what sort of behaviour would he have to manifest for you mm. to have him count as a falsification of your belief that everybody is rational? And as a supplementary question, <coughs> Uh, we're all rational, but are some people more rational than others? Mm, good questions. Um, yeah, the, uh, it'd have to be reproducible. It, it wouldn't. You wouldn't. Uh, it wouldn't be a case of just observing someone um, entertaining inconsistent beliefs. You can for, talk to as long as you like. It's like a Turing test. Yeah. <laughs> Well, if they were persistently incoherent, for example, uh -huh. yeah, I think that would be uh, good. I think that would be a counterexample. When, when you say incoherent, you just mean consistently inconsistent, not consistently unintelligent. Persistently incoherent, yeah. contribute a little bit about my, it's very, very brief, but about um, how I came to libertarianism and how it, it involves irrationality and, and rationality. Um, when I was about 14, there's, you know, the, the Che Guevara. Yeah. I, I, um, you got the t-shirt. Um, I started with the imagery when I was about 14 and then, then became a socialist yeah. through the imagery, which is completely rational. Um, came to libertarianism through rationality, understanding the economics behind it and, and working for local government and just seeing the mess um, that it is. <laughs> so interesting, like, yeah, came to libertarianism through, uh, through rational thought. Now, how, how might we, we get people interested in libertarianism not necessarily through rational thought? Because I don't think we can expect everybody to become interested in, in libertarianism through, through rational means. So I think it's important to maybe ask people, um, when I say libertarian, what, what, what kind of imagery is that to you? And, and how does that imagery make you feel? Um, and that you know, the kind, of, the kind of marketing side of it. Yeah, well, as I, I open with this idea that um, all emotion is cognitive or involves some thoughts, theories. But they may not be uh, linguistically formulated theories, but every emotion um, is encased in a theoretical um, container, if you like, <laughs> for want of a better metaphor. Um, yeah, so I don't think uh, that seems. I can't imagine what you would, what you would do actually. What it would involve. Well, I mean, if if, if somebody thinks of. I'm just going to make up a, an imagery. Somebody thinks of the libertarian being uh, like an American in the mountains with a shotgun. Um, that might be a, an image, an image, and then they think, well, what, what, is, what do I feel about that? Yeah, well, Can there I you go. Your, that's a theory and an emotion relating to that. Yeah. And they might not even consider it, even though if, if they looked at, if, if we had the time, um, they, they might get the economic 
Well, well, obviously you make it, insofar as you can, cool and trendy, so that you take photographs of people with their head on one side, because they're quirky, <laughs> they don't take, you know, they just don't swallow ideas, they yeah. think about things, so, right, come on, yeah. also you're being hard done by, as we so said, <laughs> don't tell people they can improve themselves, tell them they're being screwed wrong, yeah. so that gathers their attention very often, so there are various ways of doing it. Yeah, there's, um, yeah, sorry, go on. The question was, well, why is that question? Uh, in America, anti-libertarians are now saying, oh, you're right, yeah, you've got loads of arguments, you know, yards of, yeah, 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 but it's your values. It's your values that make you feel libertarian. You're like chiseled, chiseled jawed entrepreneurs staring into the middle distance and earning lots of money. That's why you like big businesses. <laughs> That's just another example of the yeah. point you're arguing against. I saw his hand, I didn't even see your hand, so I suppose he's. <laughs> By accident, he's first and you're second. All right, so briefly, it's on very sorry, sorry, but uh, Stephen sorry. Davis, when he talked about the rise and fall of classical liberalism, said that uh, popular culture was really important in the rise and in the fall as well of uh, the idea. Uh, poet, um, comedies, writer, books play a big role in making liberalism popular. And then there was a shift in the artistic class who changed the allegiance of idea and they made it as well impopular later. So just to make books, movie, and everything that is popular is a big part of uh, influencing ideas as well. Yeah, I tend to think it, uh, it's the other way around. I think you get the movies and yeah. the t-shirts after the, the intellectual movement has changed. Well, uh, um, and that comes about through books, the influence of books. I, I wasn't talking about uh, which one led to the other. I mean, oh. how to how people, how the rational uh, argument succeeds to convince people that, uh, yes, there is a rational yeah. argument and there is a popular culture as well with more entertainment. Yeah, I, I don't think that marketing is irrational. I think it's, well, it's I supremely rational. In different so, of a debate where we yeah. sat down and said, oh, yes, this is logical, this is logical. I didn't mean the uh, strong can be more. There's nothing wrong with being entertaining. Yeah. You know, I, I, I agree with you. I yeah. Just, just meant yeah, but it's it not irrational, and it doesn't uh, set it. It doesn't enclose people in a, in, you know, the imprisonment. They're not imprisoned by marketing. No, I agree with you. Uh, I just answered okay. to the marketing side. Oh, sorry, I was misunderstood was your no, I where you're coming from. <laughs> to, to be swayed by the ideas that won't jump in, you have to pay attention to them, mm. and it may be the, the marketing that gets you to pay attention. Yes. Well, actually, I just wanted to cough out of speak anyway. Um, it was just, um, yeah, well, I've been kind of calling myself a libertarian for a few years now. But then it almost made me question myself as well in thinking, well, hold on, I consider myself to be an individual and putting myself under a label as being mm. a libertarian, that may be a bit of a contradiction. But I find that libertarianism is the ideology which most aligns with my own. Yes. Um, which is why I'm here today after a few years of calling myself a libertarian. Um, but just to go back to a really fundamental point about all of these arguments about closed mind, um, what I was just wondering is whether there is actually some psychological um, deep origin for this, for the reasons why people cling on to things such as wishful thinking, um, uh, blind faith as well. Is it something that's built into human beings to, as a kind of safety mechanism, um, in that sometimes the mm. truth can be so disturbing that it falls into their whole yeah, I, yeah, I would um, hold to the, the, that understanding um, that uh, wishful and fearful thinking are, are about important or urgent issues uh, in your life. And therefore, those thoughts are worth testing and retesting because you can be wrong.
and I think that they've evolved. Um, we are creatures of Darwin in evolution. And these uh, methods or heuristics of thought have evolved to deal with that problem. Yeah. David? So are you saying that the heuristic is that people will tend to be more prone to criticizing and testing their, their important beliefs or less prone to doing it? No, they're, they're more prone to hold on stubborn, stubbornly to the, the right. belief. But what it, you said was, would be inclined to test their important beliefs, which would suggest that they'd be more inclined to criticize them. But as I understand it now, what you're saying is that they're more prone to hold on to them, which would, which would therefore suggest that they don't want to criticize them. Uh, no, the, the point, the, the way I put it is that um, for a, a theory or a belief to be tested, you, I mean, it's got to be produced. You've got to produce it. And for it to be retested, it's got to be sustained. And it makes <coughs> sense to sustain a belief in, a, in something important or urgent. John? You, you said that some people hold on to their beliefs stubbornly, but that comes perilously close to saying mm -hmm. that some people hold on to their beliefs irrationally. But stubbornly <coughs> being a word that we are allowed to use, an irrational word that we're not allowed to use. Well, I think that there is some methodological uh, value to sticking to your guns to see if they're loaded. Yeah. Could it, um, could it be a cognitive illness? You know, like a sort of mental, cognitive, sorry. Cognitive illness. Like a mental, like REBT, to use, you know, for people who are depressed or for people who have got problems in their lives where they're, they're being, you know, their patterns of thinking are essentially irrational. <laughs> Reality should be, and that's not actually how reality actually is. And that's disturbing. And is this the same? Is it actually already just sort of a mental or cognitive illness? And when people are holding on to beliefs that contradict reality? Well, I think that the, the idea of com, uh, cognitive illness is as incoherent as mental illness. Um, I think in the med medical context, we know exactly what an illness is it's a condition of t tissue damage or a condition liable to lead to tissue damage. But when it comes to the mind, I don't think it, 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 it applies. And uh, I mean, rational emotive therapy is based on the idea that you can argue people out of <coughs> their um, depressing or fearful thoughts. I, mean, in, I think. In, in, the, I've looked into it, and in, 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 in that, that therapy, they, they talk about irrational thoughts. They talk about this, this thinking you've got is irrational because it doesn't, it's, it doesn't match reality. You, know, you think that I'm, I'm, you know, I must pass this test, and actually, you know, the reality may, is that you might not pass that test. You know, there's no must there. Your thinking there is irrational. Yeah. Well, I, I don't want to monopolise the word rational. Okay. Um, but the point there is to notice that the the, the whole point of therapy there is, is premised on the idea that you can change people's emotions by changing their ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, there are good Popperian reasons, which you should produce from inside your jacket, as it were, to say um, why things deserve testing, why you should not just say, oh, well, there's a consensus, or, you know, 97% of scientists say such and such. Mm. So that's so that, so that settled it, or induction has settled the matter. So it's not simply that if you have an argument to say, well, you know, it's not set, you can always find examples or you ought to look for them, you may not look for them, you may stumble over them, you may get bored, whatever yeah. Whatever the reason is for coming out of one set of ideas and adopting another, there are there are good good arguments to say that you ought to be doing this, not simply it happens, mm -hmm. but you should actually seek counterexamples, seek good arguments again. Yes. David, then this lady here. Well, actually, yeah. as David's already, sure, yeah. uh, this lady here. Um, who is sort of 
What do you mean to get them to be more exploratory? Yeah, to, crack the, the, to, to manage to, to establish a communication and, yeah. uh, you know, put forward the arguments. Because well, if, if this is not possible, um, what do you think is the best way? Is it more through, a, a, you know, a, yeah. an argument put together which follows a, a sequence of logical thing? Is it uh, an emotional, I would say, setting? Is it something of both? Is it something else? Uh, through your experience, how do you practically see that? First, I would ask, I would get to know what they think and feel, find out what their beliefs are, their old, and their habits of thought, and then you can address uh, the the benefits of changing those those th those thoughts or habits of uh, methods. So are you arguing that so, there might be certain beliefs that were more beneficial to them as a whole, so you would highlight the benefits of holding that belief, or are you saying you can follow their chain of logic and find a point where you can break the chain of Both. Yeah. David? Yeah, um, I think I'm right that actually your conjecture is, I mean, a lot of the answers which you've given to the questions this evening have been very courteous answers, uh, but I think I'm right that, that actually well, your conjecture is there's no such thing as a closed mind at all. Mm -hmm. If somebody is presented with an argument that refutes what they believe and they understand the argument, they have no choice but to see that as a refutation. Uh, that's basically it, isn't it? I mean, that, that's at the heart of it. Now, whether or not you can get somebody to sit down at all, mm -hmm. or whether they'll storm out, yes. or whether they will listen in the sense that they are, uh, the, the, the words are actually going in, may be a different question. Uh, so, how you get to the stage where you can convey mm -hmm. the argument is a whole different question. Like marketing and being nice to people and so on and so forth. But once you've got them sitting down, and if they understand what you're saying, and if it logically refutes their belief, they have no choice but to perceive that as a refutation. That's, am I right that that lies at the heart of your conjecture? Yes. Sound answer. Yeah, but I would, <laughs> want to, I would like to just qualify it. If they you know, understand if, it. If they understand oh, yes. it. They don't have to understand it. It's the only propensity. Uh, um, but I also, I, I would say, if, uh, it's so important to promote, you know, the, cr the critical ethos. But, but um, if they understand it, because that is a voluntary. If they understand it, mm -hmm. and it, and therefore they understand that it logically refutes their belief, they have no choice, mm -hmm. in a sense, but to see that this is a refutation. Mm -hmm. What they do with that may be a different question, but, yeah. but that is key, isn't it? Yes. All right. Oh, yeah. You go. Well, but that is a. Isn't that a circular argument to say that if they are rational, then they are rational? That's that's basically what you what you're saying. Of course, if they're rational, then they're rational. But uh, are they always rational? Is 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 the problem? Because you can always say he didn't change his mind because he didn't understand it. Because if he did understand it, he would have changed his mind. So this is this is kind of going nowhere somewhere. somewhere. This this whole thing cannot be tested in in, in, in any way. Uh, you, you just it's 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 right because you, you have to find it to be right. You could argue it's being tested from each side. So if you're attempting to convert him, he may convert you. So again, inadvertently, one of you is going to say, "Well, that's a stutter, that's a stumper. Um, I think you're wrong, but I can't think of why." And then some weeks later, you may come across and say, "Well, here's the answer." And then you say yes, you're right. No, but or or you or you say no, I can't. It's yeah. You're right. Yeah. Uh, well, interesting. To what Nico said, but also uh, your remark that you're not not writing the word irrational. In a sense, you have to at least in the sense that every time somebody puts in a claim of irrationality, you have to translate that into what you think is really going on in, in order to defend your thesis. So you can say the person is being imprudent, uh, but it's not inherently irrational to be imprudent, or they're being illogical, 
or they're just making it, uh, uh, they're just misperceiving something. So you can always, you always have to be able to give an explanation as to what's really going on. Yes. And that explanation will, uh, I think, almost always be testable. And therefore, what you're saying is not simply, um, you know, a way of speaking that yes. you're trapped within. Because somebody, you know, you can actually discuss whether something is logical or not, and whether they do understand what they said is logical, and then you can explain it to the for yourself. Yes, I, yeah, I agree. And, and it would be quite a challenge, though, to actually build up the case or the description of that person to the point where it indeed it becomes testable. Christine? I, I wonder how many times people have fallen to your knees and said, Master, you should do this. I mean, that would be irrational, wouldn't it? <laughs> be a counterexample. Why should they call him Master? That's right. um, in, in the real world, that generally is not uh, how it happens. Uh, people change their minds uh, simply because they change their objectives. Uh, they change their goals, not because they are more rational or less rational. I think that you, you, you said that you started from the assumption that generally people are rational. Um, but they have different purposes and they have different goals. So if I take the shortest route to go from where I live to where I work, that would sound rational if my objective was to take the shortest route. And then if I didn't take the shortest route, you would say, well, you are in contradiction with your own discourse and your own purpose. But I may take a long route for another purely rational reason, that I enjoy walking across a park or that I enjoy going through a street uh, that has a lot of beautiful shops. And, and so it would make sense to not take the shortest route and being perfectly rational because I have other purposes. I want to exercise more. I want to enjoy the scenery or and so on. So you have to look at what are the people's objectives. And then it's only if you accept their objectives that you can, uh, or, or you understand their objectives, that you can make a discourse to say, well, you are in contradiction with your own objectives. But the problem you have when you try to convince people of changing their minds and so on, is that you have to convince them of changing their objectives. And if somebody says, well, my objective is not to live in a capitalist world. My objective is I would much rather live in a world where people are poor, but more equal, uh, more, uh, I don't know, uh, less competitive, and, and so on. And that is difficult to argue against, because that is a preference. And what's wrong with that preference? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's universally true that uh, you can understand partly, it's, it's, it's almost like a necessary preliminary that you have to understand people's behavior in terms of a means end structure. And those ends, uh, um, they, they do vary from person to person, but I don't see why that make, makes the people locked into um, in, in, you know, into a, a system of, of ends. Yeah, because I actually disagree with that. I don't think that the, the ends really do vary between people. I think that the strategies to achieve it is very between people. But the, the ends, you know, things like you know, security and meaning and things like that, everybody has the need for those. So you can kind of maybe you can ask why, why they why they favour that preference, you know, why they why they favour that strategy. And it would be to fulfilment of their needs, which which everybody shares. And then you can sort of maybe bring them up to that level to change the strategy, saying, well, we could still achieve this need with this other way of achieving it. Yeah, and there's also the possibility that uh, the ends that people cho uh, choose are actually incompatible. They can't both be achieved, just as a matter of fact. I think you're on to something. I think you take us to another discussion. 
David. Surely, 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 the short answer to Christian's point is that he's completely wrong. <laughs> 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 well, we know that, but we've got to give the long answer to make it easier. <laughs> to take an example, if I mean, I mean somebody who. Uh, who, uh, who has as their greatest value the humanity lived in misery. Uh, fine, but, but that doesn't stop them seeing the truth or the falsity of a theory that says the best way to achieve liberty and welfare is libertarianism. Because the fact that, they, that their value is completely different is wholly irrelevant, or, or as I understand it, on the basis of your conjecture, is wholly irrelevant to their ability to understand the argument that libertarianism will lead to liberty and welfare. They might not want yeah, liberty and welfare, but that's a big different question. Well said. Is there anyone else who... Uh, uh, Bob? Um, uh, no mind is closed, but are some minds mm. less closed than others? <laughs> I, well, I think that some... Uh, yeah, I think there's a very... Uh, there must be some kind of variation in res, you know responsiveness to arguments, just you know, just as a variation in intelligence, speed of processing. If you can't read fast, you can't get done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jan, well, the trouble with that is, I mean, as soon as you admit that there are degrees of rationality, then people can say, "Well, I'm not saying these are completely irrational because I'm just saying." I don't think highly irrational. I don't think rationality was speed on taking up. That's right. Yeah. I don't violence. think I don't think speed or intelligence is the difference in rationality. In other words, someone who's dead thick isn't necessarily more <laughs> irrational than, than say Isaac Newton. They both. Uh, it's just that the dead thick person can't com comprehend Isaac Newton's book, but then neither could Robert Hooke, and, the, and he was one of the greatest scientists around at the day. It was written especially so Robert Hooke couldn't understand it because <laughs> well, he lacked the mathematics. <laughs> So he, he, well, he, he lacked the mathematics to understand it, and, and he, he also made false claims like Leibniz did over the calculus about Newton. Oh, <laughs> that's fine. I, I think that uh, basically, moral beliefs not only remain being, but they agree that uh, rational thinking makes sense, and that whatever decision they make makes sense at least to them. Um, unless there are some exceptions, like this gentleman said, because of an illness or, or some um, um, incapacity or something like this, mm -hmm. most human beings think that they took a decision rationally. I hope so, at least. Now, I think that where the problem may be is more at a level of critical mind, um, means that what is the each a person's capacity of abstraction, of being able to picture an idea in their mind and be able to process the way of thinking. Um, they may want to do that because they're rational being and they want to take a decision that is the best for them. Uh, but perhaps they can't <coughs> picture it out. They can't go through this thinking process, this critical uh, process. And therefore, this is where perhaps some intellectual ability or you know, the, through the education or through different things can come into into uh, into the picture. So um, I don't know if there are any limitation that you can see in that. If there is a way to develop that in people, if you think that um, you know, if that, do you really think that you know, critical mind is is uh, more I would say adapted to this problem that really being reasonable and unreasonable, which I think most of the people are reasonable trying to be. And whether there are some limitations to a critical mind, can it develop or, or not, according to you? I think people can always improve their um, critical capacities and uh, they can adopt more critical uh, methods and uh, the, you know, the ethos of give and take of argument. Um, it is, I mean, that is not involuntary. I mean, that's a voluntary thing that whether people actually adopt um, things like like we <coughs> like what we're doing this evening. We're we're deba debating. I present an idea, and then you try to knock it down. It's a trial balloon. Yeah, but um, some people are not perhaps able to do that. They they, they would like to, hmm. but they're not able. That's the thing. That's, I, that's where I, just, I disagree with that. Voices. I think everyone can improve their logical reasoning. Uh, their the, no, the, the, the thing uh, is basically you have some politician 
who managed to get voices of uh, that happened in France, for instance, uh, the extreme right uh, uh, wing um, has gone uh, suddenly grown up. Uh, why? Uh, because they did uh, uh, statistics among, uh, like a pool among uh, French people, and they could understand what they were talking about. So for these people, they were convinced because uh, either the level of vocabulary or the, the fact they were presenting were making sense to them. So all these people that voted for the far, uh, far right wing in France, it was all a, a, a rational, uh, uh, a rational uh, process, right? Based on what they could understand and what made sense to them, because they yes. couldn't understand what other politicians were talking about. Yes. So obviously, th there is, I mean, there is some impact on the, the, the possibility of some people to understand through communication. It can be a link to communication. It can be linked to uh, you know, marketing or things like this, but it's also linked to the capacity of the person and how they, pro uh, how they receive and how they can process that information. So it's a kind of both way, you know, communication and interaction uh, that uh, depends, you know, that is dependent on, I don't know. Slide <laughs> back. Is that kind of down to logic or down to emotion? No, it's, it's logical. If the people understand, what, uh, if they voted for someone because it made sense to them and they could understand, it's not emotional. They said, oh, yeah, I agree with that because uh, I understand what he's talking about. Do you see what I mean? But that's not really logic. Sometimes people... But it's logic then. You know, so, I don't think it's logic because if you're talking about the right thing and you're saying that lots of people don't understand what they're saying, they might be feeding into their emotions and saying this is what you want to do. There might be some emotional but feeling, but the people said that now, you know, you agree or disagree with that, but for these people, what the politician put forward made sense to them. They said, we understand what they're talking about and we agree. So to me, it seems logical. It might not be our logical, but... <laughs> no, 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 this lady there and then Simon. This, this lady here and then Simon. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to put forward an idea, but it's kind of just basically um, what I've observed of, of people that I think that surely all this is explained if you accept that every human being we are all uh, motivated by self-interest and that self-interest might be of uh, what we might label good self-interest or bad it might be overt it might be hidden but that is how humans operate and then everything that's labeled either a belief or um, emotion or logic or reasoning it's very simple for me and what I see of people in life it, 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 we all can um, um, we, we've all got the capacity to do those things and feel those things but we are motivated out of, um, so so someone can be convinced in an argument if somehow some way you can convince them of something that fits in with their self-interest um, but they will never be convinced if, if, if you can never reach that point with them, yeah? And um, someone, you could never um, uh, convince somebody who's wedded to an emotion. They might be wedded to an emotion about something, but that's, that's about their self-interest because they might want to protect an idea or a belief. And say, for example, I think of religion, and I can think of someone who I've had arguments about religion which doesn't make any sense whatsoever um, but they will never ever change that belief no matter what you put in front of them because um, for them there's some self-interest in there and, and, and that particular person I'm thinking about is an emotional self-interest that they don't want that uncovered they don't want that exploded and that would be too disastrous for them um, and I think that explains everything so I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, um, I do believe it, it's, uh, some beliefs can be look stubborn, um, very, very stubborn. But um, I think it's important in, in this context to think of ourselves as creatures of Darwinian evolution. Our ancestors could not have survived um, if they, they didn't pay attention to a recalcitrant reality that was very, uh, root, you know, would just ruthlessly exterminate them. Yeah. So then there must be a limit 
to the stubbornness with which we hold on to our fearful or wishful beliefs. That's what that's what I'm just doing. Simon? Yeah, uh, I'm, I mean, some danger of saying what she said. Um, ah, good. I, I <laughs> I'd like to put a word to it, and that is incentives. Um, that, that correspond to reality, for example, is one, one incentive. And for someone who isn't self-absorbed, uh, correspondence to reality might be their prime motivator. They might be on a mission really to discover the truth. Mm -hmm. Or they might be purely self-motivated. For example, being an sort of two uh, character who's promoting socialism because it puts them in a position of power. Um, which leads me to kind of venture uh, a falsification or a, 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 a characteristics of a, a falsifying individual and that based on Ellsworth 2 that is an Ellsworth 2 is not a person uh, that would promote an idea because it gives them power but they might uh, continue to promote the idea um, even though they uh, because they stubbornly refuse to accept perhaps they're hopeful uh, they refuse to accept that, that their idea doesn't work and they haven't persuaded anyone and they die in that state of mind mm. You know, I don't have an immediate response to that. You know who Wells worth two years. Yes. You know who Wells worth two years. Character. Yeah. Character in the Fountain Head by Ayn Rand. Oh. <laughs> no. Does no? No. I thought. I thought. I thought he might. I thought he might have figured. I thought he might have figured an anti Randian reaction. Yes, that is. That's quite often the idea may get linked up with a person's pride. And they'd lose space with the game. Well, that would be one incentive. Uh, but, I mean, there's nothing, the incentive theory nothing that Ray's saying which would, it goes against that. You can also take pride in being the sort of person who changes their mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, they fully understand that their idea doesn't work, but they continue with it. getting confused now. I've got to, do you want to speak, Bob? Well, one, well, then then Bob, uh, then uh, Jan did. So it's Bob and Jan. Uh, the point about self interest is you have to have an idea of what your interests are, and mm -hmm. you have to have an idea of what would serve your interests. And this is theoretical. The second point is that um, just as you get the plumber in to do something, a lot of people get someone else in to do the thinking for them. I mean, they know he's roughly right. You know, he seems a decent bloke. He seems to know what he's talking about. He yeah. seems to be talking sense. Yeah. Go to him. Go to him. Yeah. He'll explain why I'm right. Yeah. So people do, do that. No, yes. That's not irrational. No, it's, the, it's what I call the wise man in Edinburgh <laughs> the thesis. Yeah, we, 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 I can't explain the problem, but there are others brighter than me who can. You know, and, and we, we do rely on that. Uh, that's quite rational, but we're, we're taking a bet on the wise man in Edinburgh. But very often the wise man in Edinburgh is no better than so the you, are. you can be rational and wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, of course, yes. So we're certainly, we're certainly wrong getting, even if we're... Well, I, disagree. I don't think you uh, need to know what your self interest is, because it might just be that it's... You, you need to be right, but you have an idea of what yeah. it is. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think yeah. that's the point. Can I disagree, though? Oh. Because I think... No. You've got no idea. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 well, do you think exactly. it's true enough? Exactly, you have to be aware. There's plenty, plenty of people that operate in the world that are not aware of um, how, why they're behaving in the way they are. Oh. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Well, I think we've finally ended the meeting then. Thank you very much indeed for coming. Thank, Thank you very much indeed for